Good afternoon and welcome, welcome, welcome to the RTPI Northeast Health, Wellbeing and Inclusive Planning Seminar, um, which was planned uh, prior to um, everything that's just happened this year happening. Uh, I was rather expecting a face-to-face -face meeting. I'm certainly missing those, but the opportunity we have with this technology now is we can reach people from all over the country and I welcome you from wherever you've come from. I'm not sure we have an international participant, but uh, if we have, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, I think it's very timely we're having this this, this uh, seminar at the moment now. I think I think in many ways the recent crisis has highlighted the inequalities in our uh, places, your experience of lockdown is very different depending on where you live and how you live, and place has got a large part to do with that, and certainly another part in terms of access to green space, and in many ways being close to the countryside, or at least close to nature, can have a huge impact on your resilience and your ability to be able to deal with shocks like this, uh, let alone the other issues that we've got potentially around, you know, the correlation between high, higher densities uh, and, um, you know, effectively, um, you know, towns that have um, towns and cities that have a high population density and perhaps poorer housing, and that then correlated with uh, the the incidence of COVID nineteen. I think is is an interesting correlation to make. Um, on top of this, um, I think we've got other things that are coming our way. The the, uh, the government is 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 planning to do some pretty significant things um, to planning. Um, and, and actually, part of the question we need to ask ourselves is how, as, how are we as professionals going to work with all the other agencies to deliver health and well-being outcomes for everybody? Um, so I think, you know, I think there's a lot to talk about today. We've got a, a fascinating range of speakers. So uh, we have um, Michael and um, uh, Claire from uh, PHE, um, Mark Cope, uh, an associate from Hawley, and Rachel Murta. Uh, from the Tees Valley Nature Partnership, who's the partnership manager. So we've got, well, three lots of views, really, a public sector view, a private sector view, and a third sector view about, um, you know, different approaches to securing health and wellbeing outcomes in planning. Uh, I believe that you're all muted, um, so uh, sort of keep it that way, and then that way we won't get any interference uh, on, our, um, on our presentations. Um, and I, I look forward to uh, being able to get your questions. So if you've got any questions, please send them in on the questions box and I will seek to try and gather these and uh, ask questions on your behalf uh, if there's a theme they're developing. So uh, first of all, I would like to introduce um, Claire Matthews um, and Michael Chang from uh, Public Health England. Um, so Claire Matthews is Health and Wellbeing Programme Lead for the North East for Public Health England. Claire has worked in the North East in public health for over 20 years, joining PHE in 2018. Her role at PHE involves leading work around healthy weight, physical activity, healthy places, and she also provides public health support to the North East and North Cumbria integrated care system. Prior to joining PHE, Claire commissioned and managed a range of health improvement services within the former primary care trust in the North East, and most recently within the NHS Foundation Trust in County Durham. Michael Chang is a Chartered Town Planner and Honorary Member of the UK Faculty of Public Health. He previously led the Town and Country Planning Association's Reuniting Health and Planning Initiative and currently as Programme Manager of Public Health England, he provides expert spatial planning input across a number of topic areas such as obesity. Michael initiated and co-founded the Health and Wellbeing in Planning Network and is Visiting Fellow at the UK World Health Organisation Collaborating Centre for Healthy Urban Environments. Panel Chair of the Essex Live Well Develop Development Accreditation Scheme and Policy Fellow with the UK Collaborative Centre for Housing Evidence. I give you Claire and Michael. Thanks very much, um, Tim. And apologies, uh, folks, if you can't see me because I've had to dial in um, this morning because my IT wouldn't quite allow um, my laptop to work. But it's really great to be here. And I'm just going to give a very brief um, introduction really to, to set the scene for Michael's um, presentation, really just to give you a bit of a flavour of some of the North East context. So you're probably um, uh, aware um, how Public Health England is um, structured, but just to sort of recap, we have sort of national teams um, within health improvement that provide you know, expertise and support um, in areas such as healthy places, so the, the team that Michael's part of, and then we have uh, more local regional teams. 
So within the Northeast, um, I'm based within one of those regional teams, and we've recently just um, at PHE um, merged with our Yorkshire and Humber colleagues to form one Northeast and Yorkshire team. And we very much provide that um, support to key stakeholders, such as local authorities and the NHS. So really that interface between the national team and that expertise and those on our local stakeholders. Um, so in the Northeast, um, we have a series of association of directors of public health sponsored um, networks or sort of communities of improvement. Uh, and I facilitate the one we have around healthy weight and physical activity, which is where our healthy places work um, sits. And this brings together the 12 local authorities um, within the Northeast, uh, brings together the public health leads who lead around healthy weight, healthy places, physical activity. And really, we're looking at how we can work collectively together. So what can we do at scale? Um, across the northeast, where we can do it do it once, uh, really, and really to sort of share that practice. So, for we've doing, been quite doing quite a lot of work around whole systems approaches to tackling obesity, and really using that as a learning uh, platform uh, within the group within the northeast to take our work forward. So, we have a really strong um, track record of collaboration in the northeast, and um, so, for example, um, doing a lot of sharing and learning around uh, work on SPGs that the local authorities have been doing, um, around takeaways, particularly uh, given the levels of um, deprivation we have uh, in the Northeast. And just to sort of, I suppose, bring a little bit more context to, um, in terms of um, COVID, um, the network that we have in the Northeast is the re really the key forum for collaboration. And so the COVID has impacted on our, on our work program, uh, but also has highlighted um, other areas for action or sort of where we wanted to maybe um, really accelerate some of that work. And as we all know, the impacts of COVID, whether that's indirect or direct, uh, are not felt equally um, within our communities. Uh, and you'll be aware of the PHE report around disparities in the risk and outcomes of COVID has really highlighted that, that those disparities, whether they're age, geography, um, ethnicity, occupation, um, really highlights that COVID has re replicated those health inequalities and actually in many areas, and particularly in the Northeast, has actually increased those inequalities. So there's something that we really need to consider in terms of recovery planning from COVID and healthy environments and healthy places are really key to that. So if we look at applying a health in order policies approach to um, recovery and really that building back better theme, um, would mean that local authorities are looking at um, their policies to avoid um, any harmful impacts and looking at how they can uh, improve population health and health equity. Um, and in the Northeast, we've been doing work to try and um, support uh, this type of recovery planning and have developed um, local authority health inequalities checklist to support uh, local recovery cells and recovery planning based on recommendations within the Sir Michael Marmot um, 10 years on review. And specifically within our, our, our local network around healthy, healthy weight, we've been really trying to get some local intelligence and understand the um, impact of some of the temporary changes to regulations that have come in, particularly around sort of takeaways and food delivery services, um, given the high proportion uh, that we have in our most deprived areas. And really exploring whether, um, given that there wasn't a, um, a national um, health impact assessment done on that change in regulation, whether we'd like to do one in the northeast. And so I suppose on that, on that point, it seems a good point for me to, to hand over to Michael, who will go to a little bit more detail. Thanks, Michael. Right, thank you. Um, um, good afternoon, everyone. Just kind of say before we go on to, to my slides, um, PPH is an organisation still do exist. Um, and so very much a lot of our work around healthy places and planning um, still do continue on. So please still stay engaged with, with, um, with the organisation. Um, the next few months. So my slide is looking at the planning system and, and do we have the tools, if you like, to deliver on some of the issues that we will be talking about around healthy environments, healthy healthy places. I guess this diagram shows you the planning system as it is today and, and we know that it, it will potentially change um, a lot or not a lot um, with the planning white paper. But the key point about this slide is, is really um, public health involvement in the planning system can be diverse, like many entry points to the planning process for public health professionals and many of you planners who do um, engage with public health teams will understand that they get involved through evidence and data um, other, or through policy developments, through SPDs or even at planning applications level. So there are plenty of things for them to get involved in. 
and the planning practice guidance and the national planning policy framework um, are obviously, obviously very, very strong and clear about how to promote healthy and safe communities. Um, a key question is, do we have the tools um, in, to enable us to do that as planners and as local authorities? And I'll go through my slide, um, particularly focusing on, on the use of health impact assessments, if you like. Um, but there are many challenges that we all face, um, or that you face at local authority level, um, that we have to be aware of. And actually, there, there are things that we have to acknowledge um, before we can move on. And this slide um, just highlights five points from a lot of actually different studies and research by both academia and um, organisations like the Design Council and, and TCPA um, to to kind of find the barriers to healthy placemaking, if you like. So if you look at the chronology of, of studies, the health, uh, Design Council published healthy placemaking back in 2018, looking at barriers and challenges and opportunities. The TCPA, through their State of the Union report back in 2019, um, PHE ourselves, we published a report based on the national survey last year, in November 2019. And then obviously the, recently the RTPI with the um, enabling healthy placemaking um, report as well. And, in general, um, the key five points are there on the screen. Firstly, we have to recognize and appreciate that there has always been awareness of health and well-being in the planning process. You know, even from when back in the you know 19th century with garden cities, it's always been there in the planners' education and in planners' kind of minds, if you like. At the same time, now we know the um, we know the kind of knowledge about the planning system across the the health professional health sector is a key remains a key concern. And many of them do not understand how the planning system works, or they only know elements of it in order to have, have any kind of proper effect. But I think we have to be aware of what is the public health USP, the unique selling point within the planning system. And I would argue that the health impact assessments could be one USP um, you know, within, within the planning system. The majority of the challenges that we all face around planning for health um, are relating to very, very practical um, technical issues. Uh, for example, how do you translate public health evidence, either from academia or from the public health system, into planning practice? And it's always been and, and continue, continues to be a challenge and a barrier, and we're exploring how that can be used um, you know, in, the, in our coming uh, um, documentation. Secondly, um, there are competing local priorities, and we appreciate in other areas there are issues around housing and, and open space provision, viability that potentially might undermine or even promote healthy development, healthy, healthy communities. Um, so there are those quite nuanced local issues that we have to be mindful of here, here, here at the national level. Fourthly, surprisingly, there's no, well, not surprisingly, there's no shortage of guidance, if you like, around planning for health available to you in local authorities all across the whole system. In fact, there may be too many. Um, you've got national guidance, active design, um, and other things. You've got local guidance around planning for health. There's just too many out there. Definitely across England, there isn't one overarching one that um, the government uh, promotes and encourages people to use. Um, and that's why you get so many different um, the versions of planning for health, which I think is fine, um, but again, it's the complexity of, of guidance out there that many of you will find challenging to navigate. And then finally, there's across the whole system as well, not just around the whole agenda around planning for health, is that local government resources and capacity remain the underlying challenge. And um, and obviously, with the planning white paper, there's a need to improve and increase resources into local government in order to implement white paper, as well as to address existing concerns around capacity. So, looking at the kind of um, no. issues, whether you have the tools oh, or not. Okay, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, we do want to find out exactly why and how there is policy alignment, if you like, in local plans at least around planning for health. And so, this research by the Town and Country Planning Association published uh, last year looked at, if you like, the, the alignment. And I'm highlighting the first two columns here, and it's where things like health impact, impact assessment could be quite useful. So if you look at the promoting transport, good, good design and open space provision, in general, there has been quite good um, alignment and integration with health into those planning policies. But the first two columns is in a, are areas of concern where there isn't, if you like, a policy readover between um, the health priorities and health evidence with the, the look, with the local planning system. And that's where we need to focus our efforts, definitely in public health, to make sure that there's an alignment between what public health teams would like to achieve around health in place um, versus what the local plans want to achieve around health in place as well. 
So the main barrier which the RTPI found in their recent um, report was health is a material consideration in planning, but there's no statutory way of assessing the impact of health unless local policy supports the use of health impact assessments, HIAs. And I think it's where I want to pick up on the point of HIAs in my following um, kind of final slides, if you like. So what is the health impact assessments? And many of you will, will know the HIAs. It's not a new tool um, in, in, you know, in the process. It's been there for many, many years. Um, but I guess what I would like to highlight in that kind of bottom half of the slide is that actually the HIAs can help mitigate negative health impacts, but also help promote um, health, uh, health uh, benefits, if you like. So having that net health gain rather than just protecting poor health. We want to improve health as well as protect poor health. And the HIS can do that and help planners do that. Um, uh, and obviously how local public health teams do their, uh, their kind of health improvement duty under the Health and Social Care Act 2012. But the state of current HIS and planning is very, very diverse and very, very mixed. Um, not, under, no, not surprising because there's no policy requirements around the use of HIAs. Um, but from the TCPA's research, around 30% of local planning authorities um, have a policy in their local plans uh, on the use of HIAs in the, in the planning applications process. So it's not across the whole of the country, that's, you know, that's only in certain areas across the country. And I think in the Northeast, you have um, a lower percentage, I think, um, of uh, the use of HIAs um, in, in the planning process. Around 25% of councils in the Northeast, I think, have a HIA policy. At the same time, though, there are many triggers um, that councils use to trigger the requirement of HIAs um, because there's no national trigger. And again, this is fine because um, what works in one area will not work in the other area. What's significant in one area isn't significant in the other areas. But what we are not seeing is a consistent use of triggers. And so if you're a developer, um, planning applicant going from one council to one council, you're faced with different triggers or even no triggers at all if you go across the, the border. So um, what we want to achieve then using planning to deliver healthy communities, healthy places is, is this. So this is from a PHE evidence review published back in 2017, um, looking at um, um, existence of evidence to, to kind of address impacts and health outcomes, if you like. And this is only, I'm only picking out one theme and that's our neighborhood design. So you've got planning principles, that's great. And those looking at walkability, compact neighborhoods are all fine. I think as planners, we do understand um, what is good urban design, good planning. And that flows um, into modifiable features, which are specific policy areas, policy interventions that you can try and promote. But what's not so clear, definitely in, you know, in the planning for health agenda is that flow into the impact. So how does the work that we do in planning in urban design have an impact on people or places? And ultimately, how does that flow into the outcomes they want to promote, um, say around reducing cardiovascular disease or promoting um, physical activity and things like that. So that kind of pathway doesn't quite exist in the thinking currently from, you know, around planning for health. And so how do we address that, um, that gap at the moment in time? So they're, they're, they're kind of, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a case to be made for improving the coverage and the use of health impact assessments, not just as a check, a check um, kind of list, uh, exercise, but actually to add value to the planning process. And there are levers currently in, in, in planning policy and guidance to help um, help do that. And I'm highlighting the MPPF and the PPG, uh, which are very clear about when you can use HIAs, um, if you like. But uh, on the wider level, local authorities um, have a, a duty to improve health in the Health and Social Care Act. Um, and that could be a way to justify the use of HIAs um, if, you, if you feel that can help improve health, um, or at least to protect poor health. But there are other levers as well. At the Prevention Green Paper, um, there's a line about improving coverage of health in non-health non settings. And I would see the planning system as one of those settings. Um, I think to mention the, the use of SEA, EIAs, there are health um, uh, factors in there that we have to consider in regulation, um, population and human health. And then finally, Claire mentioned the, the pH review of, of COVID-19 with the um, minority groups. Um, and there's a line in there about recommending a greater use of HIAs in there to promote health, health equity, social equity. So there are, there's a good case in policy terms and research terms to, to use HIAs. Um, and that's why PHU will be publishing a guide um, very shortly um, to do that. And I'll mention that in the next slide. So our guide will, will hopefully be launched in November with a webinar on the 12th of November to help our councils work through the issues 
and hopefully add value to the process and the, and the, and the burden. Um, but like anything else, like I said at the very, very beginning, it's, it's a complex um, world of guidance out there. And for HIs, it's similarly as, as, co as complex. So you've got there a, 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 a diagram to show the existing range of HIA guidance out there. So if you look at the top um, kind of a uh, row, you have the P PHA forthcoming guide, which is the beginning of the exploratory stage for HIA, whether you use one or not. In the middle, the actual doing the HIAs, there's plenty out there. Welsh, the Wales have presented um, their guidance. London uh, Health and Urban Development Unit have got their guidance. And many councils have their own HIA local SPDs as well. Um, so there's no shortage of guidance around how to do an HIA. And then similarly, there's a, a lot of guidance out there around what do you do after an HIA? How do you quality assure and monitor um, the use of HIAs? It's, it's kind of out there. The bottom row is looking at other other ways to get health into the planning system, um, not just through the health impact assessments, but through EIAs, health in general, planning for health in general, um, as well as international examples about health and SEAs and health and EIAs coming forward from the, from the WHO. So it's, it's quite a, a kind of crowded marketplace, if you like, but hopefully the PHE's guide in the top left kind of box will help initially make the case for why do you need the HI in the first instance um, mm -hmm. to drive forward healthy communities, healthy places. And then, you know, if you want to do uh, do an HIA, then you go to the other guidance. So hopefully we'll, we'll meet the gap there. The PHE guide will be focused around how to, that initial process, I said around, around exploring how to use the HIA um, based on the PPG line about you only use HIAs where there's significant impact identified. And so in our guide, we'll have two, uh, one figure. Uh, and they'll be properly and properly figured, numbered, not just, you know, figure one, figure one. But figure one on the left-hand column is firstly, do you need an HIA? Because I think it's where many councils are still thinking about it without a strong policy requirement. And I think we do feel that you need to think about the policy priorities locally, um, the health needs um, locally, the population that you want to focus on, whether it will be those who are homeless, who are those, you know, in deprived communities. And then you go on to say whether your plan, your local plan policy or your development might have a significant impact, the likelihood of that impact. And then you determine your trigger points about whether that um, would uh, allow planning applicants to do an HIA. The second figure, figure two on the right column is looking at, okay, once you've got you know, the process of establishing an HIA that you need one, what do you do in the first instance about screening for an HIA? And that takes you that whole process. Um, I won't go through that in detail, apart from to say, please join our webinar in, uh, in November and we can go through that in more better detail and take you through it um, if you want. So finally, to kind of finish off, um, the planning tools to deliver healthy communities, um, you know, what are the kind of key benefits and key conclusions, if you like? Firstly, just being aware that there are many tools out there in the planning toolbox. I've only highlighted health impact assessments, um, but the planning white paper highlighted things like local design guides, local design codes, and many other things that can actually be reframed and repurposed to promote health. Um, they're not specifically to promote health, like HIAs, but they can be used if you want uh, in those situations. Um, looking at things like HIAs can help you identify and consider health issues in a more systematic way that we're not currently doing in the planning process in both um, developing your local plans or making a decision on planning applications. Um, HIAs and other ways of doing planning for health can generate good evidence recommendations um, for the plan to be at, as health promoting as possible, or if you'd like to promote net health, health and wellbeing gain. Uh, fourthly, to allow decisions to be based on health and wellbeing and quality issues. Uh, many of the things that we use in planning are not used primarily for health, um, but I think the use of HIAs, for example, can be specifically air value, um, looking at health and quality issues, not just those around the environment and, and other things as well. Finally, we all want to achieve uh, a bit of collaboration between planning policy officers, um, DM officers and, and public health professionals, and having the NHI in, uh, in place can help with that better collaboration and partnership working. So that's all I'll end there. Hopefully that's one kind of quick run through of one tool that we can use to promote health um, and, and planning. And please join our, our national webinar um, program this year, beginning um, in, in October around active travel. Um, any questions, please email us or join our Knowledge Hub. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthew and Claire. Um, we, we haven't got a lot of time for 
questions uh, just, just now. Um, if you have some questions uh, for any of our panelists, um, please please ask, ask them in the box. I've got some in already, but uh, you know, always welcome to get some questions. And, uh, and thank you very very much for that. Um, very very useful. Um, <coughs> if you're still there, uh, just quickly, um, mainly for Claire, if you're still there, was that you mentioned recovery planning and building back better. Um, and, and to what extent is your experience of uh, professional planners been involved in that discussion? Because I'm slightly concerned I'm hearing that that planning as a discipline isn't necessarily as embedded in recovery planning as it could be. But I was wondering what your views on that were before we move on. Yeah, um, certainly. Um, well, in the North East, we've, um, we've got a big piece of work going on around a, a North East Health Inequalities Impact Assessment. And, and part of that um, has been trying to um, develop things that will be useful for, this, for the system as we go into recovery planning. So we've um, developed, I uh, briefly mentioned it, this um, health, and it's like a health inequality screening tool or a checklist for local authorities based around the Marmot um, um, recommendations. So we've developed a really simple tool um, and then we've, we've piloted that down in um, Middlesbrough and it's in South Tees, uh, where they've had a series of their reco recovery groups, so sort of regeneration town planning groups, um, and they've used these checklists as they're developing their recovery plans, and it just helps them think through what are some, maybe some of the one or two things that they could build into their plans um, that ensure they maintain this focus around health inequalities. So again, it's really about you know really um, maximising the opportunity around that health in all policies. So um, anybody who's interested in that, that work, um, we've got it up on our we've got a C Works, which is like a K Works hub in the northeast that anybody can access. Um, so we're using that tool um, and we're just sort of rolling it out and, and improving it now and the local authorities are using that um, as, they, as they see fit really. So we have got some examples of, um, of that being, uh, that, that engagement with um, sort of tech with planning. Brilliant, thanks for that, that's brilliant, thanks Claire. Okay, uh, it's time for us to move on. I'd like to introduce to you now Mark Cope, an associate from Hawley. Mark Cope is an assistant at Hawley, sorry, an associate at Hawley LLP specialising in environmental impact assessment. Mark is an IME, IEMA registered an EIA practitioner and chartered environmentalist with 15 years environmental consultancy experience. Prior to becoming a consultant, Mark began his career in local authority and county planning and environment departments. Mark has coordinated EIAs across a range of sectors from commercial developments, urban extensions and town centre redevelopment to flood defence schemes and nationally significant highways infrastructure projects. Mark works closely with technical design and assessment specialists at Hawley to promote early design solutions for mitigating health and well-being issues. I give you Mark Co. Great, thanks very much, Tim. Um, so uh, I'm going to give a bit of the um, uh, 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 private sector consultancy uh, perspective, um, perhaps today, um, from the uh, uh, perspective of uh, environmental planners and, and designers and how we can influence health and wellbeing outcomes uh, of new development projects, um, particularly in light of the uh, increased attention to health and wellbeing during the current pandemic. Mark, can you just un unmute yourself, please?
I think we may be having some problems with Mark's um, audio. Mark, can you hear? Um, yeah, I can't this, hear Mark. No. Well, while Mark's sorting his audio out, uh, I can't promise to do the uh, BBC throwing a pot video they used to have when you used to have continuity problems or whatever. Um, but um, hopefully we'll get Mark back um, in, a, in a short while. Can I uh, can I make a suggestion? Um, Rachel, could you could you do your presentation while Mark sort, sorts his technical issues out? Would that be would that be okay? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. Sure. Okay, Mark, we'll give you we'll give you a minute or two to sort this out, and uh, and I'll introduce you to Rachel Murta, who is the Tees Valley Nature Partnership Manager, um, and uh, well, part, which is and also Tees Valley Wildlife Trust. Rachel manager of the Tees Valley Nature Partnership. Brings over 25 years' experience in the environment sector, including work for local government, national park authorities, wildlife trusts, and freelance. She has a background in environmental science, countryside management, and sustainable development. A keen wild swimmer and general outdoor enthusiast, Rachel is passionate about the cultivation of ecological awareness through engaging hearts and minds in the personal and social change needed to ensure a vibrant future for our planet. So I introduce Rachel Murta. Great. Uh, hello and good afternoon, everybody. Hopefully you, you can hear me OK and uh, you can see my slides. So, yes, I'm obviously going to be coming <clears throat> from a natural environment perspective uh, within health and well-being. Uh, uh, so I won't say any more about this. You can see the slide and Tim has very ably introduced who I am. <clears throat> right. OK, so nature partnerships. Uh, very briefly, just to give you a bit of context. Um, what they are. Um, back in 2010, there was uh, the government um, commissioned a review of our wildlife sites across uh, across the UK called the Lawton Review, which fed into a government white paper that was published in 2011. <clears throat> and what uh, the findings of that were basically that despite all the efforts um, of lots of uh, dedicated people and certain resources and funding, that our biodiversity it was continuing to decline. Um, across the UK. So um, the catchword was bigger, better, more joined up. Um, and that's of, of our wildlife spaces was needed. Uh, so looking at a holistic systemic approach um, rather than a piecemeal sort of habitat and species approach. And to reflect that, uh, it was suggested that, that we have to re reflect that too, the way that we organise ourselves uh, as human beings um, to, to enable this to happen. So hence the idea of nature partnerships. And here we are. This is our translation of what nature partnerships are supposed to do. There's three main purposes. Um, and we were um, uh, ratified in 2012, along with the, the other 47 uh, nature partnerships across England. And critically, as you can see from the third bullet point, we're supposed to work closely with local authorities, local enterprise partnerships and the health and well-being boards as well. So it's this, this, these three areas of sustainable development in order to achieve better outcomes for the environment and for people. So um, our nature partnership, uh, they, they're all, all supposed to adapt to local circumstances. Um, and uh, it's worth saying at this point, uh, which I make sure that I shoehorn, shoehorn into every single presentation that I give, we have never seen a penny from central government to support this. Great idea, but it's up to us to find the money to do it. So there's a really patchy approach in, in, in how, how effective we've been. Um, this is our nature partnership in the Tees Valley. We're quite a small one. Um, there's uh, in the rest of the region we have the North East England Nature Partnership that covers the rest of the North East, and we also have the Northern Upland Chain, which is sort of uh, all the way down from um, uh, Northumberland all the way down the North Pennines, and that's very much focusing on the protected areas. 
So scale wise, we're quite small. We're very, very people focused, as you can imagine in the Tees Valley, because we haven't got iconic landscapes, but we do have people and we do have communities that really need to access green space. So that's the focus that we've taken. We're currently hosted by um, the, the Wildlife Trust. So we've got a, a really good balance of third sector perspective plus um, public uh, sector in the form of um, local authorities, as well as, as you can see from this, uh, lots of interest groups as well. So we aim to reflect that whole pan of, of different organisations across our partnership. So here we are, we work along to four themes, um, natural assets, natural growth, and here we are, natural health and wellbeing, because of course we recognise that um, people need nature just as much as nature needs people. It's, it's really, really critical. And I'll go into a bit more detail about that and in terms of the health and wellbeing as we go on. So uh, partly I was invited along today to say, well, why? You know, what, what's the point in all of this? Why, why do we, we need to look at nature in terms of health and wellbeing and planning? So hopefully I'm going to cover that as best I can uh, um, in my presentation. But I will flag up hot news, hot off the press. I don't know if many of you have seen this today, that Boris has um, announced um, the intention to protect 30% of the UK's land by 2013. And as you can see, I don't know if you can see the detail, but that's uh, up from 26% that is already um, protected, um, up to 30% by 2030. Now, it, it's worth saying that even though 26%, which might seem quite high, is protected, the quality of that protection is really, really varied. So it's not just about um, having green spaces, it's about having quality green spaces. And our triple S sites, for example, our sites of special scientific interest, half of them are considered to be in poor condition. So it's about quality as well as quantity and this connectedness, bigger, better, more join. Right, enough of that. So um, this is a, just flagging up something, uh, the State Nature Report that's produced uh, by the State of Nature Partnership. So these are all the big players in the nature conservation sector across the UK, um, including um, the RSPB, uh, WWF, the Wildlife Trust, all, all the ones that you can imagine um, um, come together and produce this report. This is last year's re report, the previous one was so that was 2016. And yes, biodiversity uh, is continuing to decline. And this, of course, is an international trend that we're all, all aware of, um, but this sort of flags up our, our national trend. These are England statistics, but there are statistics for Scotland and Wales, and there's also national UK statistics here. Basically, um, we live in a small island uh, that is really densely populated, and um, unsurprisingly, all the activity of all these people in such a small area is having quite an impact on our biodiversity. Uh, coupled with this, of course, is climate change, um, and that's having an in, impact um, as well across uh, nature uh, and um, our wildlife sites. Um, so th these are the other graphics are from the Committee on Climate Change. Um, I've just flagged these up because this is specifically about health. These, this is actually infographics from the US, but uh, so the, the, the statistics won't um, align directly with it with, with us in the UK, but it just uh, it does show um, the sort of effects that climate change are, are will have and that we've got to build in to our, our planning in future. So flooding, of course, we're very aware of that in the UK, um, property loss, um, da damage, water contamination, um, air quality, of course, that's very particular in, in certain areas, um, as well, and, and all the health impacts on that. Um, Vector-borne diseases, they put Lyme disease uh, here, they're particularly highlighted, um, as well as rising temperature. I mean, year on year, we seem to get uh, the, the hottest year on record again, the hottest year on record again. So just to really, really emphasize what we're facing here. So here we are, what are we facing? Yes, we are facing multiple crises. Let's, let's, let's just lay the cards on the table. There's a lot of talk about the climate uh, emergency before we went into the current um, health emergency. That hasn't gone away, that is still there. Um, of course, we're facing mass, mass extinction and biodiversity collapse that I've just, um, talked about, but we're facing a health crisis as well, this obesity epidemic, um, as well as this inactivity um, issue here uh, across the whole of the life course, not, not just uh, children that's often cited. And of course, on the back of our um, of austerity, we've got this looming economic um, catastrophe. And unsurprisingly, all of this is having a massive impact on our health and well-being um, to all of us, you know, uh, we're all receiving all these messages all the time. You know, whether you're particularly interested 
um, into certain areas of it, we are receiving it. We, we get this information. And what in the heck are we going to do without this? And of course, not to mention we're living through a global pandemic. So I was looking for an inspirational quote. I couldn't find one, so I made one up myself. Um, I'm very lucky that this is on my, my morning run. I do have access to green space on my doorstep. And that, that was a sunrise um, last week. So we need to heal ourselves. We need to heal the earth. And the only way we're going to do that is actually by spending time in nature and building up that relationship together. And this was really, really highlighted in lockdown. I'm sure many of you access local green space. So there's mounting evidence about um, what well, uh, they go um, that's uh, referring again to a report uh, that Michael was referring to. And there's a whole section on the natural England. They've got a whole raft of evidence that they built up. The Wildlife Trust um, uh, commissioned some work from the University of Essex to, to particularly uh, uh, look at the well-being benefits. There's all sorts going on. There's enough evidence out there to say it's good for us. Here we go. I'm going to particularly pick out this one. This is Nat uh, Natural England. The Mimi report. This has been a 12-year survey um, that they've done. They've slightly changed it this year. So this is um, the 10 years up to 2019. And as you can see, um, visits uh, to our green spaces, particularly, I'd like to highlight here, in our towns and green spaces has increased in the last 10 years. So our, our green places are getting busier. Yes, there's been a population increase, but the number of visits has also increased. 36% of this, these visits, 1.5 billion, um, is to these, these green spaces, these urban green spaces. And it's doubled, doubled in the last 10 years. So. But so quite um, encouragingly, though, um, the distances are getting shorter. So people are visiting their local green spaces. And as you can see from the pie chart in the bottom, 64% of these are by foot. And as you can see from figure 12, the, there's a declining um, reliance on the car to get you to these green spaces. So people are going to those local green spaces. Bearing in mind, this doesn't include lockdown. So this has been accelerated in what we found in the lockdown. And fortunately for us, um, there has been some specific studies done during lockdown and the, the bar at the top is showing some work that the Ramblers Association did have done during this time. But what it did highlight, uh, just to reinforce a Public Health England uh, um, presentation earlier on, that this is in, this, there's an, an inequality to this, unfortunately. So lower income families um, are less likely to live within um, uh, easy reach of green spaces uh, and a good walking distance here. So it's it's a nine page document, the Ramblers Association one. I'd, uh, I'd uh, suggest that you go and visit that. It's uh, it's, it's uh, really good. And again, um, these quotes at the bottom are from that public health um, report earlier on. Um, and it's worth saying, unsurprisingly, uh, people um, report higher life satisfaction when they live in greener urban areas. Um, so here you go. This is just reinforcing the inequalities. And of course, it's coupled with this, uh, as Claire was saying earlier on, we've got some of the most vulnerable communities here in, in the North East and, and of the very people that need to access um, um, uh, health and wellbeing services, um, nature being one of them, um, they, they are less likely to as well. So the green box is from the Ramblers Association, uh, the figure nine again is from the MENI report by, my, by Natural England. I wanted to highlight here. Um, as well about the types of um, uh, things that people are doing in these green spaces. Um, so um, 60, there's been a huge increase in wildlife watching and by far this is shown to have the, the best uh, health and wellbeing outcomes. So it's not just about what you're doing, it's the quality of the environment that you're visiting. It's not just mown green spaces or uh, um, green parks, it's about the quality as well. And this is coupled with the awareness um, of, that, people, that adults have got um, of and their concerns about biodiversity loss. So 2014-15, 49% of adults were concerned. That's up to 62% in 2018-19. So um, we've, there's a lot of scope to improve our green spaces. And as you can see, this is reflected in the number of people getting involved through volunteering as well. And uh, they bring in a huge amount uh, into the economy through their efforts. And there's a little uh, local example there, but this local example is reflected again and again and again in each area about the importance of, of wildlife to people's lives and green spaces. So why do planners need to work in partnership? 
uh, Public Health England, that was great. They talked a lot about partnership earlier on. Um, I'm not a planner. I haven't got planning expertise. It's, it's quite baffling on the outside. Uh, it's and frustrating that we know that there's mechanisms there, there's potential there, but that, that there's, it's, it's very difficult to penetrate from the outside. So there's this need and this demand, and we're voicing that. Um, but it's having the means in order to, to make the changes because we're not making the changes clearly. The reports are showing we are not adequately making the changes yet on the ground. But there are opportunities if we start to break down these communication barriers between these different sectors. Um, of course, there's on the horizon is the Environment Bill, Biodiversity Net Gain, Nature Recovery Strategies, as well as growing public concern. So just our experience here in the Tees Valley, we've got five planning authorities, um, quite small authorities. Um, they're keen to work with us. They need support and help. Um, we want the support and help, but it's matching that. That's matching that with the resources needed to um, get the wheels flowing and to, to make these changes. And just as an example, Greater Manchester, um, they've done a lot of work. We've started to do some work too around natural capital, so the economic benefits to nature. And as you can see here, nine billion pounds worth of healthcare costs, healthcare savings within 60 years from natural capital and we're seeing a very similar um, um, from our natural capital work here in the, in the Tees Valley. Um, that's just um, flagging up that there is money in the system, there is money in the system um, but at the moment we, we've relied too heavily on the third sector having to access lottery funding or the public sector having to um, uh, access a diminishing pot of, of money to pay for these things. We all need it, we need to oil the wheels so we can liberate some of this innovative funding to actually um, make sure that these areas are protected and that crucially that our communities have got access to these green spaces. We need it now more than ever as we're finding in these critical times that we're living. There's so much more I could say. I hope I've inspired you and um, please send in your questions to Tim. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Rachel. That was that was really informative. Um, I hope everybody else found that that useful. Um, if you've got questions for for Rachel, that would be brilliant. Uh, if we could uh, put those onto the system, um, I've got a few that I could follow up with. But I'll uh, we'll see if Mark can join us. Mark, are you are you back? Hello, can you hear me, Tim? Yes, way excellent. Right, excellent. okay, you ready to launch back in, Mark? <laughs> yes, yes, I am. Yeah. So sorry about that, everyone. I seem to completely lose my microphone there, but um, I'm, I'm aware that we're time is ticking on, so I'll jump straight back in. Um, so to to influence um, what to, to understand what influence we we can have on health and well-being outcomes, um, we need to think in terms of the determinants of health. So these are the range of interacting factors that shape the health and well-being in a population. Uh, the relationship between determinants of health and urban land use planning was conceptually modeled by Barton and Grant, which I'm sure many of you recognize the diagram. So through their health uh, map for urban planners, this provides a framework that puts the health and well-being of people at the heart of planning. Um, and then there is now a substantial body of evidence to link the determinants of health with, with actual health outcomes. <clears throat> so uh, planning provides us with the opportunity to influence these outcomes. Major developments in the UK cannot proceed without planning approval and sometimes an environmental impact assessment is required. Uh, and the environmental planning inputs to planning applications must address the health and well-being and other impacts that a development is likely to have. Where these impacts cannot be addressed voluntarily or through conditions, then developer contributions for community infrastructure are often sought by the local planning authority. However, we live on a small overcrowded island where developable land is at a premium uh, and the commercial reality is therefore that new development land is as much about increasing land value as it is about land use planning. But economic value is not the only measure of a development project's value. The Association of Consultancy and Engineering's Five Capitals Model of Sustainability recognises that social and environmental values are just as important. We as environmental planners can help with this by focusing on the health and well-being outcomes for communities which relies on all five capitals. This value-led approach seeks to balance the economic, social, and environmental values. However, opportunities for creating value need to be considered very early on in the project development life cycle in order to make a real difference. So to influence design early on, the planning white paper makes reference to the Building Better, Building Beautiful Commission's report, Living with Beauty. This proposes to fast track the planning consent of beautiful buildings with the use of pre-prepared design codes. The report recommends that the planning system should provide a measure of quality in terms of well-being, public health, nature recovery and beauty. 
Such measures where designed to provide safe, healthy and attractive places to live, work and enjoy can have a large influence on the value that new developments can bring to an urban area. It is therefore of particular importance that these values are optimised for health and wellbeing outcomes through high quality design principles. So how can we measure health and wellbeing values and outcomes in development projects? Well, the concept of health impact assessment originates uh, in public health policy making. It's a process that seeks to predict the consequences of policy decisions on future health outcomes to better inform decisions. There are similarities with the EIA process and in 2017, human health was included within the EIA regs as an EIA topic. When thinking about how health impact assessment relates to land use planning, we need to recognize the social gradient exists. This is a phenomenon whereby people who are more disadvantaged have a lower life expectancy and a lower disability free life expectancy than the more advantaged people. On average, people from the most deprived areas of England will have almost 20 fewer years of healthy life expectancy than those from the most advantaged areas. There are also similar but slightly less pronounced trends for overall life expectancy, which is represented by the upper data curve shown on these graphs. Similarly, the index of multiple deprivation reveals that spatially concentrations of deprivation exist in the large urban conurbations, former industrialised areas, coastal towns and parts of East London. But it's important to note that pockets of deprivation surrounded by less deprived places exist in every region of England, even the most affluent areas. Because health inequalities are spread unevenly across different, group, different groups, this can place a burden on public health services locally. By understanding the social needs of the local population, we can design in measures to ensure that new development projects do not create or exacerbate health inequalities. Through health impact assessment, relatively small changes can be identified to optimise the health outcomes for all. And relating back to Barton and Grant's model, by maximising the value of the built environment through land use planning, we can influence people's ability to be active, the local economy, the community, people's lifestyles and ultimately people's health and well-being in, in the centre of the model there. So within urban areas, the principal determinants of health are often the factors that influence the quality of the built environment, including housing stock and affordability, accessibility to local services, availability of open space and amenity areas, and building design and functionality. These factors determine how well people are able to live their lives and can influence the health and wellbeing outcomes of whole neighbourhoods. The example I've given here at the building scale illustrates a number of conflicts between different aspects of its design. For example, the size of glazing to let in natural light, the need for natural ventilation to prevent overheating, particularly in the context of climate change, and the impact of external noise sources such as road traffic. Early design interventions focused on improving health and wellbeing outcomes could include reorientating the building to give a better aspect, setting the facade back from the road, and creation of open spaces for community use. But, but our health and well being also relies on the condition of the natural environment in terms of the global ecosystem and climate, but also in terms of the range of ecological resources, processes and sinks needed to maintain a healthy environment. The benefits people get from the natural environment are collectively referred to as ecosystem services. The availability of ecosystem services such as clean air to breathe, a stable climate, access to nature, all have an important influence on health and wellbeing outcomes for people. Design influences on the natural environment focused on improving, improving health and wellbeing outcomes relate to the protection and provision of ecosystem services. For example, reducing reliance on motor cars to protect air quality can be influenced by provisioning for active travel or electric car charging infrastructure. Another example is to protect ecological habitats, but also to maximize the benefits of ecological habitats, both for wildlife and for humans, through the provision of net ecological gain and providing a variety of, of habitat mosaics. Now, ecosystem services are also important for disease regulation. 75% of pathogenic diseases originate from wildlife, which it now seems also includes COVID-19. Reports of human infections posing pandemic potential have increased in recent years, in particular, avian influenza viruses. Some scientists are now calling this a pandemic era. Over the last century, a combination of population growth and land use changes has increasingly resulted in large scale fragmentation and encroachment into habitats. This has, this has resulted in reduced ecosystem integrity, brought human activities into closer contact and often conflict with wild animals, and has created greater opportunities for pathogens to spill over from wild animals to people. Climate change is also a factor for disease emergence as it exacerbates these issues. The UN is therefore calling for a One Health approach, recognizing the complex interactions of people, animals, and habitats at a range of scales. 
So given the complexities, uh, given the complex interactions of humans with the built and natural environment, there are a large number of possible impact pathways on health and wellbeing outcomes resulting from the interaction of the various determinants of health. These are just a few examples given by Hugh Barton in his textbook, but to highlight the complexity, I have a database of around 80 determinants of health, each of which have been identified from peer-reviewed scientific journals as having an influence on human health and wellbeing outcomes. While it's not possible to map out all of these interactions in this way due to the level of complexity, by assessing impact pathways using tools such as health impact assessment and using the findings to iterate design proposals, then we can go some way to influencing health and wellbeing outcomes. Now for EIA development, the EIA regulations encourage us to consider avoiding impacts very early in the planning and design process. Regulation 6.2 requires that as part of an EIA screening opinion request, the developer must describe the measures envisaged to avoid or prevent what might otherwise have been significant adverse effects on the environment. In other words, to avoid the need for EIA by avoiding impacts and directly influencing outcomes. As mentioned earlier, uh, the 2017 consolidation of the EIA regulations uh, included human health uh, as an EIA topic. The National Planning Policy Guidance on Promoting Healthy and Safe Communities was also updated in 2019 reflecting this, uh, reflecting that a health impact assessment is a tool where there are expected to be significant impacts, but EIA development currently only applies to around 1 in 1300 plan applications. Assessment of health impacts on individual receptors can also be a local planning policy requirement, for example, air quality and noise impact assessments. And some of the local requirements also address wider community impacts such as open space assessments or affordable housing proposals. However, outside of EIA at present, there is no national requirement for health impact assessment to bring all of these assessments together to consider the health outcomes at the community scale. So the RTPI in their research paper in enabling healthy planning are calling for health impact assessments to be formalized as an important step towards the implementation of healthy placemaking outcomes in planning decisions. I agree with the RTPI position that a formal requirement for health impact assessment is needed, but how this fits in with the government's proposals for deregulating the planning system is, is unclear. Um, it's also important that healthy placemaking measures are considered very early during concept or master planning stages in order to maximize the health and wellbeing outcomes that can be achieved. This is something that we at Hawley have already started to engage with, and which I hope will become more widespread given current attention to building our way back to health following the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you. Brilliant, thanks Mark, that was excellent. Um, very, very interesting. I'm glad you managed to come back and, and join us as well. Uh, if I could ask the, the rest of the panel to uh, come back as well, and uh, we'll, we'll ask a few questions and maybe get a, a short discussion going before we, uh, before we go home. Um, okay, so um, just just following on from those presentations, uh, one question I have, I suppose, is that it seems to me that we we need to be aligning quite a lot of quite similar things to achieve the outcomes we need in terms of human health, addressing climate change, whatever. Um, to what extent are current and emerging local plans adequate for that purpose, and what needs to be in place as we re reimagine how we're going to do planning? Should the white paper proposals? Um, you know, take root. So, uh, do we need to re re-emphasize what the the core values are in terms of what we're doing? Maybe um, just just a question for the panel. Really. Yeah, so I, I think an interesting point of the uh, planning white paper is the proposal for design guides. Um, so I wonder if that's perhaps a, a, an early opportunity to shape health and wellbeing outcomes at a very early stage. So um, if, for example, in the design guides that the government's proposing, there is more consideration being given to health and wellbeing and also given uh, in a more holistic way, then um, maybe that provides a really good opportunity to to shape health and wellbeing outcomes from that very, very early stage, that concept master planning stage um, uh, of development projects. Um, when designers, uh, architects, developers are thinking about the, uh, the, the the uses for that site, the values that they can get out of that site, um, perhaps balancing not just the the economic values that they can get out of that site, but also the the environmental, the social, the well-being, the human aspects that they can get out of that site as well, those other values. Sebastian, that's, that's really interesting. Anybody else want to, to come in on that one? 
I and mean, just to say, I, I think you know some of these issues around healthy communities are, are mutually exclusive to other agendas like climate change and environment. You know, I think if you look at the the TCPA's work on 2019, many of the policies that we have in local plans already reference health or can be health promoting. Um, the key challenge is aligning health priorities locally, identified by local authority directors of public health, with planning priorities. You know that the community wants to see, and I think the white papers. Um, kind of proposal to have the MPPF as the main development management policy, you know, home. It could be positive because they, they, that allows local authorities to concentrate something that's quite local. At the same time, you know, having these public health issues, uh, you know, in the MPPF that all councils will have to address, that will just eliminate any of these issues about councils not addressing health priorities, you know, and things like that. Thank you. I suppose following on from that as well, the other thing I'd maybe like to explore is in terms of design guidance, um, and it's certainly coming apparent to me, we may have to um, reimagine some of the um, some of the things that we're actually providing guidance on. I think there's a real opportunity in terms of the actual orientation of buildings and everything else. But that doesn't necessarily fit in with our traditional conceptions of what streets are made out, for example. So I wonder if anybody had any, any views on, on, on that and how it might come about, because certainly if we're to not just do business as usual and make it more beautiful, but actually in some way, shape or form, really get hold of the site's opportunities. Is there any is there any feelings around that, really? I think you might have yeah, so a little bit, Mark, yeah? Yeah. yeah, so I was just going to say there's a lot of complexity around that and it's often very difficult at the early stages to be able to take into account all of those factors and uh, try and achieve that right balance. Um, I mean, the planning system at the moment is is very weighted towards the plan application and the information that you need to provide in that plan application. So a lot of work obviously goes into providing detailed impact studies to go with that planning application. But that's often quite a late stage to be thinking about some of those things and it's very difficult, therefore, to once you start to consider it in that level of detail to make the big structural changes that you need to that site in order to influence the health and well-being uh, and other values that you can deliver. So sometimes it almost sort of needs of sort of taking a step back and, and, and saying, well, you know, how do we appraise all of these things? You know, how, how can we do that from the very early, early stages? And I don't know, maybe the, the other panel members have, have got an opinion on that, how we can better shape that, perhaps through policy, um, uh, perhaps through, um, you know, uh, design codes or design guides or I don't know may, maybe there's some way that we can be doing that better getting those those things thought about much earlier on mm. absolutely I've had, a, I've had a comment here from um, Marie Howarth uh, the planning system needs to take a holistic approach when designing new projects master planning is key to this uh, but it needs full stakeholder engagement the provision of open and green space is not always seen as a benefit by developers and I think there are there, there is a tension there and, I, and certainly I think there's a um, there certainly is a, a point well made. Um, I suppose the last, last... I... Go, on, go on, Rachel. Go on, David. I was say that just so from the outside, because obviously, you know, I don't feel like I'm embedded in the planning system. As I said during my presentation, um, we're sort of almost like an inter intermediary. So we get a lot of feedback from um, the public and from local green spaces groups and residents about their frustration with perception about how planning works. That hang on a minute, there's all these, these houses being built and there's not consistency across the whole area. So one area might master plan and, and consider how you can make the most of, of this planning site so that you can put in studs or you can do a bit of nature development in the corner over there or something. But it just, there just seems to be a lack of consistency um, from one planning authority to the next. And it, it just creates lots of confusion. So people are desperate to, to, to see more green spaces and more connected cycle ways and better footpaths and all this kind of thing. But somehow that just doesn't seem to be getting translated into what's happening. And, and the perception that we seem to be getting is that people seem to be, well, hang on, all the, all the benefits are being sucked up by these, these um, big housing developers that might be national bodies. And then they're doing their bit, making a profit and getting out of the area. So maybe there's a communication thing here, but it's, it's demand is not being translated into action. And there seems there's frustration there. That's an interesting point, Rachel. Anybody want to come back on that one? Uh, yeah, it's a really important point, and it's um, trying to think more strategically and 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 how the perhaps the changes in the plan system can influence things more strategically. Um, I think it's going to be critical. Um, 
uh, health impact assessments are really important and they've got their place in the plan application looking at, at the, the detail of that specific plot but how that plot fits in with the wider area and you know um, and, and the range of services available including ecosystem services is, is really important and I think it's for the local authorities and at the plan making stage to be really putting that um, effort into making sure that where they do identify development plots that they're joined up and they're part of a wider green infrastructure or you know some other um, strategic way of looking at ecosystem services and and health and well-being um, uh, measures um, services that are, uh, that, that, that can be provided in the local area and uh, and, and really giving some detailed thought to that uh, at that plan making stage. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Martin. That's a very good observation as well. Okay, that's fantastic. Well, thanks very much to the panel. We're running sort of five minutes over. Um, first thing I'd like to say is thank you so much for the panelists for coming and speaking. Uh, thank you for everybody uh, for, for coming and giving over their lunch time to, to, to share this, this bit of learning with us. Um, I certainly found it very, very interesting. I think we're at the start of a, a, a probably a very interesting journey as we go forward and um, think about our role as professionals uh, in the future. Um, and, and all I'd say is uh, thank you very much for participating. And uh, well, I'll have a safe journey home, but many of us will be from home. So have a safe journey back upstairs or downstairs or, or whatever. And I uh, hope to see you all again very soon. Thanks very much. Cheers. Bye thank now. you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.